before I begin speaking, there's something I'd like to say. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't invent that Moses phrase. The invented by the computer scientist Saul Gorn. Then you heard of him? No. He wrote this lovely book of sentences that somehow defeat themselves, which he titles Saul Gorn's Compendium of Rarely Used Clichés. He has such lovely items in it as half the lies they tell about you are true. Another one. These days, every Tom, Dick, and Harry is named John. Another one. I'm a firm believer in optimism. It's about optimism, what is it? Another one. If Beethoven will lie today, he'd turn over in his grave. Another one. Is the I'm not leaving this party until I get home. My favorite one of all is this definition of a formalist. A formalist is one who cannot understand a theory unless it is meaningless. <laughs> <laughs> the title of my talk was, Which Talk Shall I Give? And here's the reason why. I actually had two different talks prepared and I can't decide which one to give. So I'll give a brief description of each, and I want you to decide which one you'd rather hear. One of the talks is very impressive. The other one is understandable. <laughs> okay, I'll give the understandable one. Uh, actually, it's a lot of fun. I'll say something very interesting. How people are confused. Uh, profundity to the uh, um, understandable, the lack of understanding. This is actually true. A uh, graduate student, very bright graduate student, who, when I was teaching at Princeton, a very bright graduate student from another university was visiting, and he gave me a paper to read, which I agreed to do. I had a terrible time understanding it. After much work, I finally understood it. He should have done it in so much more elegantly and in a fraction of the space. Next day, I saw him and I told him this. The idea is absolutely lovely, but you can express it in such and such a manner, which is so lucid and so much shorter. He looked very thoughtful and said, no, I don't want to do it that way. People will think it's trivial. <laughs> <laughs> Another incident. Somebody was once giving a lecture, and really, more than one person came out of the lecture hall saying, that lecture couldn't have been very good. I understood so easily. <laughs> Another incident. This is true. A reviewer once re wrote a review of a paper of mine. The reviewer of the Thomas Alonzo Church, and he wrote to the reviewer, I think you better delete the last sentence, because the author might feel offended. <laughs> Fortunately, the last sentence was not deleted was there, and far from feeling offended, I felt very complimented. The last sentence was, this paper is easy to read. <laughs> <laughs> now I want to thank you for the introduction. I want to tell you, Three other introductions I've had in the past, which are rather noteworthy. In one of the introductions, somebody introduced me and said, Raymond Smullyan is unique. I was in a very mischievous mood at the time, and so we couldn't resist interrupting you and say, I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir. I happen to be the only one in the entire universe who is not unique. <laughs> Another introduction was given up to me by Newell Belknap, who said, this is the apple of pretty much anybody, not me in particular, there's a lovely introduction, he said, I promised myself three things in this introduction. One, to be brief. Two, not to be facetious. And three, not to refer to this introduction. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Now, the last introduction is by Melvin and Vinny. Now, Ms. Riss give you some background for this. Many years ago, I showed another paper of mine, which I only recently wrote, wrote up, and will center the mathematical intelligence. Uh, it will be out in a month or two, I imagine, to accept it. This is the following. The logician Hank Ballinger, the combinatorial logician, describes some of my heuristic devices to explain Gödel's theorem as many Gödel theorems. So after that, I thought of what should after be called a mini Tarski theorem, which then led to a mini Gödel theorem. And here's the mini Tarski theorem, which is this. And it's relevant to the uh, thing, to the introduction. You have a bunch of symbols, strings of letters. Certain ones are called predicates, and certain expressions are called sentences. I use the letter capital H to be any predicate, capital X to be any expression whatsoever. Each predicate H is the name of a set of expressions of the system, sort of a self-applied system. Of course, you could transform it into numbers by like variable number, but anyhow, it's more direct to do it this way. Now, two Particular symbols, two letters, play a prominent role. The letter N for negation, and the one rule is, oh, excuse me, by a sentence, mean any expression of the form H, predicate H, followed by X. And it's interpreted to mean that X does belong to the set named by H. And we call a set of expressions nameable if some predicate names it. Well, if I say two letters play a prominent role, N for negation. For any predicate H, N H is also a predicate, and followed by X is true if the only of HX is not true. There's a typo. What? There's, oh, a, there's a typo. There's an oh. H there should be an HX. I'm yeah. sorry. That's yeah. fine. The, 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 we don't need to correct it. It's just there is a typo and people should know it. Oh, God, yeah, of yeah. course, the only of HX is not true. I, I, there should I, be an X here. I think it was X style. What? I think it was X style. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then, the letter R for diagonalization purposes. To, uh, to just the word repeat. Again, then, R H X should be an X here. Mm -hmm. oh. It's true. It's the only of HX X. It's true. X, X is the repeat of X. R, H, X is true. Please mm -hmm. actually why not work. N, H, X, equivalent to a phenomenon. H, no, a phenomenon. Sorry. H, X, not true. Second condition for this. The first is irrelevant. 
Just replace the x by Rh when you have it. You have Rh, <coughs> Rh through, you can only get h, Rh, Rh true. And so Rh, Rh is an x point of h. Mm. I'm saying that's the, that's, that's the essential gag behind most x points. I want to elaborate it. Now, how to give you toss is there. Let us call a predicate h a truth predicate. If H names the set of all true sentences, which means that for any sentence X, HX is true if and only if X is true. So to say that H is a truth predicate is equivalent to saying that every X is a fixed point of H. So to show that H is not a truth predicate, you have to exhibit one X which is not a fixed point of H. How do we draw the risk one? Take a fixed point of NH. It can't be a fixed point of H. As a matter of fact, we even see what the fixed point is. A fixed point of NH, NH, R, NH. You can actually exhibit the witness that H is not a truth predicate. And suggesting another one happens to be N R H. N R H also works. Uh, which can be very good. Alright, now. Next, come into girl. You have a certain logician who has a mathematical system to prove various of, of, of those true sentences, and his system is correct in the sense that only true sentences are provable. And in this system, it so happens, the set of provable sentences is nameable. Its name is the symbol P. Well, it usually falls, since the set of true sentences is not nameable, the set of provable sentences is, then the two sets don't coincide. And under the assumption that all the provable sentences are all the provable sentences are true, it must be a true sentence not provable. Moreover, we can exhibit it. It's simply RNP, RNP. That's a true sentence, which is not proof is true, but not provable. Now, going back to Tarski, I also have a double analog of this, a double fixed point theorem. Given two predicates H and K, there are sentences X, Y, let's say X is equivalent to, X is equivalent to uh, H, H, Y, and Y is equivalent to KX. Applying this to the two predicates P and NP, you get two sentences, x and y, which say x is true if and only if y is provable, and y is true if and only if x is not provable. And my simple argument from propositional logic as follows, that one of those two sentences is true but not provable, because you can't tell which one it is. That's one of the things I told now. Another is this. In one of my puzzle books, I give a proof that either Tweedledee exists or Tweedledum exists, but you can't tell which. And this induced Melvin to introduce me in a math lecture by saying, I now introduce Professor Spunyan, who will prove to you that either he doesn't exist or you don't exist, but you won't know which. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's quite a punch as you know. Once he was at my house, and somebody complained of the cold. He said, oh, yes, 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 as it says in the Bible, many a cold if you are frozen. 
Once he now said, oh, good night, the next one he had written a poem, which went as follows. I want to write a poem on a sheet of paper, on its surface, that is, not its essence. Now, to extract the essence of paper that he profound, that makes a mission in order to write one. <laughs> you remember that? You also sort of characterize that as sort of Zen like, which in a way it is. Speaking of Zen, by the way, say this story. If you know that Zen Master Suzuki was once uh, lecturing at Columbia, and he said, This Zen is not as difficult to understand as you Americans think. It's so difficult to talk about nothing without missing the point. It's <laughs> 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 very interesting. There's some, a passage in Kierkegaard, which I thought reminded me very much of Wittgenstein, and somebody else thought was very Zen-like. To me, it's very Wittgenstein-like, which is this. Uh, a man attests the store with a sign saying, Hans pressed here. He goes then, you know this one? He goes then and says to the guy, like my pants press. Oh, we don't press pants. What's the sign doing in the window? Oh, it's the sign that's for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the most liquid sign? Okay, now, I'm particularly fond of illogicalities, which I like to collect. I want to tell you some of my favorite illogicalities. One was at uh, a Greenwich village, a man was on a soapbox speaking about the pride of the poor artist. He said, and a painter without paints can't paint unless he has canvases. <laughs> <laughs> Once a reporter, actually it was a snowstorm, and the reporter emphasized the severity of the storm, he said, this storm has already been attributed to three deaths. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite one is, a woman was involved in an accident, and the reporter gave the following account. Said, she was physically unhurt, unharmed, but she was in such a state of shock that she was unable to confuse with reality. <laughs> <laughs> As for ambiguities, once my wife and I, my wife knows this, I didn't. Uh, we once went into a Howard Johnson restaurant and the sign saying, please wait for the hostess to be seated. <laughs> <laughs> Not say we were in New England and the sign was right to say, please wait for the hostess to seat you. The funniest, the most shocking ambiguity I ever came across. At first, I read it the wrong way. I really was a bit shocked. It said, in the Death of Trilogy, it said, there was a picture of Queen Victoria hanging in the library. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish to say a little bit about paradoxes. Uh, I'm rather fond of the uh, following variant of the Epidemides Paradox of the Lion. Namely, the fine charlatan is one who pretends something he's not. Now, suppose if a person pretends to be a charlatan really isn't one. <laughs> okay. I'll tell you once how I was briefly outwitted by a kid aged nine and a half. I had to give a lecture at university. Here the audience something to mull over. I came a half hour early and I wrote on the board, you have no good reason to believe this sentence. All right. Well, half an hour later, I came down the aisle and there in the first row was a very bright looking kid. I couldn't resist pointing to the sentence says, do you believe this sentence? He said, yes. I said, what is your reason? He said, I don't have any. 
<laughs> so why do you believe? Is that intuition? <laughs> he escaped the paradox perfectly. I recently thought of the following combination of a paradox and an insult. You write on the blackboard, only an idiot would believe this sentence. <laughs> now I imagine two men, or two, two people, A and B, looking at the blackboard. One says to the other, do you believe that sentence? That was in class not. Only an idiot would believe that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> now he's not being logically inconsistent, but he is being what I call psychologically peculiar. <laughs> Because by saying only an idiot would believe that sentence, is obviously agreeing with it until he believes it. Yet he said he didn't believe it. So he has a curious position of believing something and also believing when he doesn't believe it. <laughs> That's not a logical inconsistency. It certainly qualifies by what I call a psychological peculiarity. <laughs> uh, I'm very fond of the uh, I want to say Ambrose Bierce's lovely book, The Devil's Dictionary, is one of my favorites. There's such lovely items as the definition of an egotist. An egotist is one who thinks more of himself than he does of me. <laughs> <laughs> he illustrates the syllogism that's false. The basis of the syllogism is a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion thus. Major premise. It takes 60 men, 60 times as fast. As, as to do a piece of work as one man. Minor premise. It takes one man 60 seconds to take a post hole. Therefore, what? It takes 60 men only one second to take a post hole. I also like what Ant or the Las Vegas said, his notion of logic. His notion of logic was this. He said, this is possible, it almost, it almost sounds right, really, it's really weird. This is possible to touch a clock without stopping it. It follows it's possible to stop a clock without touching it. It almost sounds right. Yeah. <laughs> One of my favorite solutions is uh, some cars rattle. My car is some car. So no wonder my car rattles. <laughs> How many of you know the story about Bertrand Russell when, when somebody asked him once, what is really logically new in the conclusion of the syllogism? Isn't all the information already in the premises? How many of you know the story? Oh, that's a wonderful story. Russell then wisely said, well, yes, uh, there's nothing logically new in the conclusion. Nevertheless, the conclusion certainly can have psychological novelty. And to illustrate the point, he told the following story. Once at a party, somebody told a risque story. Someone else said, well, uh-uh, be careful. Don't you realize the abbot is here? For which the abbot said, look, <laughs> we men of the cloth are not as naive as you think. The things I've seen in my life, I, I have, my very first penitent was a murderer. A few minutes later, a famous aristocrat walked in, and somebody wanted to introduce him to the abbot. said, oh, do you know abbot so-and-so? Of course I know, Long as it's first penitent. A word or two about philosophy, um, especially about Descartes' argument. Uh, of course, you know, Kant, Descartes said, uh, like my idea of being all perfection. Since the existence is a perfection, then God exists by definition. Now, of course, Kant's reputation in the article was that existence is not a problem. But I say, he goes much to the I say the real trouble is a confusion of quantified hopes for you. Why in a minute? Let's assume existence is a problem. Well, I can illustrate the point best as follows. I want to prove to you that centaurs exist, that there exists a centaur. Let me define a blentor as, a, as an existing centaur. If I can prove to you 
that a plantar exists, then a fortiori a proof that a centaur exists. Well, either a plantar exists or a plantar does not exist, the latter statement is a contradiction. <laughs> now, what is the fallacy? The fallacy is in the meaning of the word a. What do you mean all plantars exist? Yes, that's true. It does not follow the existence of mentor. And that, I say, is the real essence of the trouble of Descartes of the human. And by the way, Bible, the first thing God said was that's the real life. I said it was the second thing he said. Originally, God was non existent. But even in a non existent state, he was so powerful that he said, let me exist, and lo and behold, he came into existence. <laughs> then he said, that's the real life. <laughs> Now, <clears throat> next I want to show you the value of logic in business. So I want to give Melvin an opportunity to earn a little bit of money. <laughs> 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 I'm going to hand Mel two $20 bills. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now, here is the deal. I want to make a statement. If, this, if the statement is false, you must agree to give me back one of the bills and keep the other one. To make it easier for you, I'll let you decide which of the two we can be back. <laughs> <laughs> if the statement is true, you must agree to keep them both. So remember, you're all witnesses. If my statement is false, he has to give me back one of the bills. If the statement is true, he has to keep them both. That's a time good deal. It's pretty generous, isn't it? He's bound to have one of the at least. The whole man generous in the world, too, isn't it? Aren't you amazed at my generosity? <laughs> well, here's my statement. My statement is either you will give me back one of the bills or a thousand dollars. Just analyze this very carefully. <laughs> if the statement were false, you'd have to give me back one of the bills as agreed. But giving me back a bill would make it true that he either gives me one of the bills of a thousand dollars, which is a contradiction. Therefore, the statement cannot be false or must be true. If this is true, then like he said, it was either give me back one of the bills or a thousand dollars. But he can't give me back a bill for a thousand dollars. He can't give me back a bill for a true statement. That was the rule to which he agreed. And so he owes me a thousand dollars. You're all witnesses. thousand dollars. I'm so rather ashamed of myself. I'll give you a big chance to win back your money. No, I'll tell you what. I'll give you a chance to instance. It's sort of a dual version of this. This actually happened when I was uh, when I was a graduate student at Princeton. I would frequently visit New York City. On one of my visits, I met a very charming lady musician. On my first date with her, I said to her, do me a favor, I want to make a statement. If the statement is true, would you give me all the way with her? Don't assume why not. So if the statement is false, you don't give me all the way with her. Okay. So remember, a true statement gets all the way with her, a false statement is not. The statement I made was, you will give me neither your autograph nor a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> if the statement were true, you'd have to actually give me an autograph as agreed. <clears throat> Therefore, that would falsify the statement so you give me neither. The statement can't be true, it must be false. If this is false, I should give me neither. It's true that she has to give me either. But she can't give me a word about the whole statement, so she owed me a kiss. <laughs> Sneaky, huh? <laughs> what happened next was even more interesting. Instead of collecting a kiss, I suggested we play the double and nothing. <laughs> 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 she being a good sport agreed. So she soon owed me two kisses, then four, the eight, things kept doubling and escalating and doubling and escalating. I mean, for I know that I was married. <laughs> <laughs> I've been happily married for about 48 years. Unfortunately, she passed away two years ago. Mel knew her very well. I saw it in my time. 
Now, give you a chance to win your money back, and I'll tell you what. This time, I'll cancel a thousand dollars debt, provided you answer me a yes, no question truthfully. It won't be an embarrassing one, it'll be a mathematical one. So he no longer owes me a thousand dollars, but he agrees to answer me a yes, no question truthfully. My question is, would you either answer no to this question or pay me a million dollars? Couldn't I settle for the thousand more than that? So that's one of the following alternatives. Alternative one, he answers no. Alternative two, he pays me a thousand dollars. I'm not just either one holder. If he says no, of course, he would deny both alternatives when in fact the first one did hold. So the only truthful answer is yes. So he's affirming that either he answers no or pays a thousand dollars. He didn't answer no. So he owes a uh, or a million dollars. So now he owes a million dollars. I'll tell you what. A lot of kisses, didn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 What about 14th Street? This time I'll make it really easy for you. This time. I'll ask you a question you don't even have to answer to. I mean, yes, no question. You can either lie or tell the truth. The answer can be true or false. There's no way I can find them now. Unless I can phrase the question in such a way that unless he pays me a billion dollars instead of a million, neither has yes nor no answer can be either true. Or false or not contradiction, but only paradoxical. I never said you could answer paradoxically. I said you could answer either truly or falsely. What must you do? Oh, yes. Is yes the correct answer to this question? Oh, if and no. only if, a billion dollars, the question reduces to is no the correct answer to this question? And neither yes nor no can be true or false, not contradiction. So he now owes me one billion dollars to every one of you as a witness. <laughs> I'll tell you what, no. <laughs> I'll trade you the whole billion dollars for just one kiss from Rome. <laughs> <laughs> spare poor Rome with this poor thing. I had a better idea. I'll give you back the billion dollars as a gift and claim a tax deduction. <laughs> <laughs> Now, <clears throat> the last thing I want to speak to you about is the most of, uh, it's a serious matter, and the most important thing on this whole tour is about J.B. Rosser, and about his proof of the germs that are eliminated by hypothesis of mega consistency. This is a fact known to only two people in the world, myself and Melvin, to whom I told them. But before that, I'll just tell you, uh, I'm sorry, before I tell you about that, look more I have about Mill. Some time ago, he sent me his latest lovely book, Incompleteness in the Land of Sets. And I emailed him the following. I said, Dear Mill, sending me your book was both extremely kind and extremely foolish. Why kind? The answer was obvious. Why foolish? Well, did it not occur to you that I might steal some of your excellent ideas for my next book? Will I really steal them? It is difficult for me to decide. And so I wrote. Now that I had to see a wonderful performance of Hamlet, and I wrote, to steal or not to steal, that is the question. Whether well, this is nobler in the mind of a train, or yield, and must incur the slings and arrows of remorse. To die, to sleep, to sleep, the chance to dream, to dream of retribution yet to come. I, there's the rub. Oh, Horace, can I not refrain? Angels above, help my anger's soul. Oh, cursed ill, that I was ever born to steal. <laughs> Lord Melvin, I find a sign that I will steal some of your excellent stuff. And I continue the poem. Oh, my deed is done, and it is most foul. 
The smell goes up to heaven. That temptation to not the better of my reason is a horror not to be endured. And yet, I cannot give up the fruits of my trial be. To steal from student and loyal friend, what worse evil can there be? Oh heaven, is there no help for this tormented soul? Ah, but like Claudius, my words go up, my thoughts go down. Now that I have, now know that I've decided to steal, the next question is, well, I should give you credit. That's a more difficult matter. Of course I love the bribery. I somehow think that a kiss from the lovely white Roma might be relevant to all this. <laughs> I sent this whole thing, by the way, to one of my former graduate students who wrote, Dear Raymond, cute. Now, over the years, I've noticed that most debts owed to you can be paid by a kiss from the fair maiden. Given the paraphrase of Hamlet, I will paraphrase Richard III. A kiss, a kiss, my kingdom for a kiss. <laughs> okay. Now, coming back now to this important thing about Rossi. Firstly, I'm very, I'm very, I'm very about elementary consistency. And introducing the notion of elementary consistency, I usually preface it by the following scenarios. Imagine the first one. Imagine that we're all immortal, and there are infinitely many banks in the universe. Bank one, bank two, bank three, etc. Someone gives you a check which says, payable at some bank. <laughs> bank one doesn't honor it, bank two doesn't honor it, no bank honors it. Yet, if you try a billion banks, you can never accuse a person or give you a bad check. They can always say, how do you know some one in the future won't? Another example of an of inconsistency, which I find very psychologically disturbing. Imagine we are all immortal. But there's a certain sickness which, of course, puts the person to sleep forever. It doesn't kill him or her. It just puts the person to sleep. However, there is an antidote. But here's the rub. If you get, let's say, somebody you love has contracted the disease. If you give her the antidote today, she'll wait for two days and then go back to sleep. If you give it to her tomorrow, there'll be two squibs. She'll be awake for four days and go back to sleep. If you wait n days and give her the antidote, she'll be awake for two of the n days. At any day, after a thousand years, that's say, you a long time, but God, you can only wait till tomorrow. God, <laughs> <laughs> twice as long. And so it is an omega inconsistency in the sense that, on the one hand, it's irrational to give it to her on any particular day. It's also irrational never to give it to her at all. Or put another way, on any uh, the existing day, on which you should give it to her. You know, on any particular day, you should not give it to her. And that's an omega inconsistency. <laughs> now the story about Rasa to remove the only consistency by hypothesis of This is true. Many years ago, Rossa and his lovely wife, Annetta, visited my wife, Pauline, and myself in a home in the beautiful Catskill Mountains for several days. And then that, I remember dear old Rossa coming down in the morning uh, in his dressing gown leisurely lounging around all day long until dinner time. We had many interesting conversations. And here's a point which really should be well known, which I told Mel. He suggested I write it up for the mathematical intelligence, of, which I probably will. This is what he said. I asked him, how did you manage to go about eliminating the hypothesis of own consistency? And to my amazement, he also said the following. He said, I had no intention of eliminating the hypothesis of omega consistency. I was just experimenting with various alternatives to Gödel's sentence. And when I came across this one, I suddenly realized what I could do with it. That's interesting, huh? He never intended. He sort of stumbled upon it like this. It reminds me, by the way, of a uh, 
something I heard, a rumor I heard back to you. Namely, I heard that he didn't originally plan to prove the incompleteness of the system. He plans to show it to be inconsistent. He thought that somehow a rhythm form was the notion of truth instead of provability and recreate a liar paradox. And it's, it, I guess he thought provability and truth were the same thing. But of course, the only form of provability is that um, he would have been complete as I think it's the system. Lastly, I want to show you an experiment based on an Einsteinian relativistic principle. First, I'm just tell you two incidents. In Princeton, this is true, there was a little girl who was doing very badly in mathematics. But about a month later, she improved remarkably. And her mother asked her, how come you're doing better in mathematics now? You said, oh, I heard there's a teacher every day at the school, and he teaches me how to do it right. He teaches real good. I forget his name. It was Ein something. Ein Stock or something. Of course, it was Albert Einstein. The kid went to Albert. Of course, he also. And I love, oh, by the way, this is true. It's unbelievable. I have home an elementary school book on the arithmetic in which I do discuss the whole film. And there's a picture in the book under which the said, Kirk Girl and the picture was a vice. I can understand perfectly that some of the people wouldn't know what girl would be, but I can't understand people don't know what Einstein is. And by the way, another incident about Einstein is a very fond of one. Einstein once said to a colleague, I didn't like teaching a colleague at college. Colleague asked, why not? Yeah, of course, but all the pretty, all the beautiful girls in the room, the boys wouldn't pay attention to mathematics or physics. And uh, we thought, oh, come on now, Albert. You know that some of the boys will listen to what you have to say. I said, oh, those boys are not worth teaching. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, this experiment is based on the Einsteinian relativistic principle.
Once again, you take it like this. This time, instead of making it fly around the room, I'll make it disappear completely. And so, it's completely gone, so it's not even in my pocket. It's completely gone. Well, I told you, this is based on Einsteinian relativistic principle. Let's see how it was done. The whole darn thing was a hoax. <laughs> <laughs> that handkerchief never disappeared. The handkerchief remained exactly where it was. What I did was, I made the rest of the universe disappear away from it. It's the only way I've it, you see. It's the only way I've it, not it. Otherwise, we'll have to make the handkerchief disappear. And how can I possibly make the handkerchief disappear? Did I have a magician? Thanks. Thank you very much for attending. And we're happy birthday to Mel once again.